السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدنا علما رب زدنا علما رب زدنا علما نافعا آمين اللهم آتي نفسي تقواها وزكها أنت خير من زكاها أنت وليها ومولاها آمين 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 We were discussing about the third principle in which the Musannif says وَالْإِعْرَاضُ عَنِ الْخَلْقِ Ignoring the creation في الإقبال والإدبار We had discussed about the meaning of this principle In the actualization part of this principle He says وَتَحْقِيقُ الْإِعْرَاضِ عَنِ الْخَلْقِ بِالصَّبْرِ وَالتَّوَكُّلِ this i'rad, ignoring the khalq, is actualized by sabr and tawakkul. Let us talk about these two important uh, foundations to actualize i'rad from the khalq. The first is as sabr Sabr. <clears throat> sabr is translated as patience in English, which sometimes gives a negative meaning. The problem with translation is that it does not cover the whole meaning or all aspects of meaning. This may be true with all languages. But it applies on the Arabic language uh, from, from all aspects. Because Arabic is awsa'ul lughat. It is the most vast from the languages. For this reason, Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he says in ar risala that la yuhitu biha illa nabi. No one can encompass whole Arabic, understand it in its entirety, except the Prophet. Such is the nature of Arabic language. And the majority of the concepts in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have been narrated as terms. So we may have a word in Arabic which has linguistic meaning, a meaning in language. We call it al-haqiqa al lughawiyya It has a linguistic reality. It may also be profound because a word may carry different aspects of meaning. But most of the words which appear in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they carry al-haqaiq al shariya the sharia realities. So these words are not only words which have a particular linguistic meaning, but they are also terms these words connote concepts. So it is very difficult to understand these concepts in a different language. To appreciate all aspects of the meaning or to appreciate the intended meaning of Allah. Because a word may have many meanings, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a particular place wants to emphasize a particular meaning. So the intended, intended meaning is, if the word has five meanings, the intended meaning is number three, for example. It is almost impossible to reach the intended meaning or to, to understand all aspects of the meaning in the translation. This is a very important masala. And one of the reasons for our downfall 
as a civilization, the ummah, is this is that we are disconnected from the language of Islam, Arabic. We are not able to understand at least the majority of the ummah, even Arabs, even Arabs. They don't understand the language of the Arab, uh, the, the language of the Quran, the Fusha. So we are taking the understanding of our religion, which is the foundation for our revival from the translations and it hampers the meaning. For this reason, some scholars in the revivalist project of the Ummah, there can be different areas where we have to work for the revival of the Ummah, political, uh, economic, uh, spiritual, all aspects. He envisioned uh, that from the uh, main revivalist projects of the Ummah should be uh, understanding the terminology of Islam. Al-Mustalahat, Al-Ilmul Mustalah, the science of terminology, because we're disconnected with the terminology of Islam. And the main reason is not understanding the language. The word which connotes our religion and Islam itself, there is a lot of confusion in understanding it. You will hear some people saying Islam means peace. And the word peace has a particular meaning in English or in the Western civilization, peace. It is usually used as an opposite of war, right? So when we say, Allahumma anta salam, oh Allah, because Islam is derived from salam, salima, yaslamu, to attain peace. We say, oh Allah, you are salam, you are peace. Same applies in all terms. And some of these terms, they are used <clears throat> by common Muslims every day. Like haya. al haya min al-iman. Haya is part of iman. How do we translate it? We cannot say shame, modesty. Modesty is uh, the best word which we are using now. But how do we translate it? We have a hadith in which the Prophet said, In Allah Hayyun Kareem. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Hayy, full of Haya. So do we say Allah is full of shame or modesty now? Haya is a concept. So these some of the revivalist scholars, like uh, there is a Moroccan scholar, a uh, Sheikh Shahid Bushikhi. You may not you may uh, not have heard this name before. But he is, some of these scholars, they are not famous because they are not motivational speakers and they don't produce uh, general stuff for the ummah. And they are working on producing intellectual stuff. For this reason, they are only famous between scholars, uh, scholars and students of knowledge. Dr. Sheikh Shahid Bushikhi from Morocco. He worked on and he, he has produced some good works in it. Ilmul Mustalah. Or we can say he propounded a field of knowledge, which is new. It is old and new at the same time. Ilmul Mustalah, the ilm of terminology, understanding the terminology. We know uh, the famous revivalist uh, who worked in uh, understanding uh, the social sciences. Uh, Dr. Ismail Raji al Farooqi, he was a Palestinian and then he studied in America. He became a professor there. He, he was well versed in Western uh, thought and philosophy. And he gave the concept of Islamization of knowledge. Islamization of knowledge. And by knowledge, he particularly meant social sciences. He has written a beautiful treatise. It's brief. You can find it, I think, online if you Google. Uh, its name is Towards Islamic English. And what does it mean? Towards Islamic English. He, uh, he uh, explained this, the, in, the importance of understanding the terminology of Islam in its original language. Okay, so he said we should not translate these terms, but rather we should transliterate them. Yani we should 
introduce these terms uh, in the original Arabic in English. And in the footnote, we may explain it because it requires explanation. So haya will remain haya, sabr will remain sabr, tawakkul will remain tawakkul. And this is a good way of Islamizing uh, different cultures and language also. Yani there are some aspects we are, which are already Islamized. For example, you will see non-Arabs using, and these words have uh, entered uh, our local languages as well. You will see people using uh, shukur, sabr, alhamdulillah, right? How are you, akhi? How are you, ukhti? Akhi, ukhti. This, are, this is, yani, for this reason, uh, the enemies of Islam or the hypocrites who claim to be intellectuals uh, in uh, our countries, they are afraid of this project. They, yani they uh, in order to refute it, they call it Arabization. Yani why are you uh, Arabizing us? But yeah, there, there may be some aspects of Arab culture. We may take it, we may leave it. It's not a problem. But Islamization is a very important project. Okay. So one of the main reasons of misunderstanding or poor understanding, even application, because uh, understanding leads to application. If understanding is poor, application will be faulty. If un understanding is profound, application will be good. One of, one of the main reasons is not understanding these terms and not understanding Islam in its original language, okay? So sabr, when we translate it as patience, it may have a negative connotation. Yani whatever happens, whatever conditions we face, whatever hardship we uh, endure, we have to be passive. Negative meaning. But if you go to the, to, to the original sources, to the book of Allah, to even the meaning of sabr in, in original Arabic, you will find it completely different. For this reason, Allah has used different forms of, or different verbal forms of sabr, like istibar, musabara, istibar, musabara, and yani perseverance, steadfastness, facing the life with positive outlook. Enduring the hardship. Okay. Uh, for example, and this has been used usually uh, with in, in, in difficult conditions, like jihad, for example. Jihad, fighting in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So basically, in jihad, you are not passive, you are active or you're proactive, you're fighting for the sake of Allah. And you're not, the, 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 the negative meaning of sabr, uh, patience does not apply here. But rather, the meanings of perseverance, steadfastness, facing the enemy, uh, yani remaining steadfast, these meanings apply. For example, in Surah Al-Imran, the last ayah, ayah, 200, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya yuhal ladheena amanu isbiru. Oh, those who have believed, observe patience. So, sabr. This comes from sabr. Wasabiru. Again, comes from sabr, but this is a different verbal form. Wasabiru. Warabitu. Wattaku allaha la'allakum tuflihun. Oh, you who have believed, perceiver and endure and remain stationed and fear Allah that you may be successful. So perseverance, endurance, remaining stationed means don't run away from the battlefield. Now, if you reflect on these meanings of sabr, you will see kuwa. Uh, you will not see negative connotation. Like which appears in Christianity, for example, if someone hits you on one side of the face, you present to him the other side. No. Okay, so this was briefly about the methodological aspect, manhajiyya. We should correct our manhajiyya. We should connect, correct our modes of thought, how we think, how we use the language, the terminology. This is very important. Most of us are taking our deen in a different language. It has its problems. It has its restrictions. Okay. So how do we define sabr? We will not go into the ling linguistic meaning. We are not discussing linguistic aspects. 
we're particularly focusing on the meanings of these terms from uh, the perspective of tasawwuf. So we're focusing on that. The scholars, they say, sabr is habsun nafsi Sabr is habsun nafsi, restricting the nafs, anish shakwa. Anish shakwa, from complaint. Hab, habsun nafsi, anish shakwa. Shak. So habs is restraining, training the nafs. Habs. Because sabr has the meaning of habs, restraining. You know, when you restrain yourself. Steadfastness also gives the meaning of restraining. You cannot be steadfast or you cannot persevere on, a, on, a, on an action until you restrain your, your nafs from distractions. Because focus also needs, uh, needs restraint, right? So, habsun nafsi ani shakwa. Shakwa. Complaint. This is one of the pillars of sadness, particularly in the modern age. Shakwa. Not habsun nafs. Shakwa. Complaining. Everyone is complaining. Sometimes it may not be physically or verbal, but in the heart, everyone is upset. Because shakwa is based on Adam thiqa with Allah. Absence of trust, trust deficit with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Adam thiqa is based on al-jahl about Allah. Ignorance. When a person is ignorant about Allah, for example, when a person does not know, because in Islam, it is not uh, the, the only obligation or uh, one of the foundations is, of course, understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illallah is the foundation of our religion. Or if we can summarize our religion in one word, we can say our religion stands for unity of truth and unity of God. Oneness. Tawheed. Everyone knows this. But it is not only about uh, knowing that there is a God who has created us and uh, he is running the affairs of this universe and he is one. Full stop. It is more about understanding that God. Or it's more about gaining knowledge about godhood because there are other religions who believe which believe in oneness of god like judaism also is a monotheistic religion and there may be other religions but how are we different or even uh, polytheistic religions they believe in uh, oneness of god in some ways like they say the the god the real god is only one but these Small gods, they are his helpers, for example. So there are religions, there are people who believe in God. How is Islam different? Islam is different because it's Islam gives you a unique concept of God, which is based on reality. It's not based on imagination philosophies. It is based on haqaiq, concept of God. So as Muslims, no one teaches us concept of God. We know that the God is there, his oneness, his uniqueness, so on and so forth. But, and yani here, because of the importance of understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because this, this understanding is life-changing. For this reason, you will see the importance or the focus or emphasis of the scholars of Aqidah on understanding the names and attributes of Allah. Okay, because the that of Allah, the being of Allah, is above intellect. We cannot understand the mahiyya. We cannot understand the essence. 
of the being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can understand the that or the existence of the that by rational arguments. That Allah exists. There are rational arguments for that. And there are arguments from the texts also. That is there. But we cannot understand the mahiyya, essence, okay, of that that. It is about aql. Then how do we know our God? We know him by his names and attributes. And understanding these attributes and names and connecting their meanings with our life is one of the most profound uloom from the Islamic sciences. So, jahal about Allah. Ignorance about Allah, his, perfect, his perfectness, his knowledge in particular. So why is it so important to believe in qada and qadr, divine decree? From the six pillars of uh, iman, the last pillar is belief in qada and qadr, divine decree. Divine decree is what? Divine decree is about the perfection of knowledge. Knowledge of Allah, ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not commit mistakes. We may take a decision based on our knowledge. But after a while, when this decision leads to evil consequences, we may regret. We may revisit our knowledge because our knowledge is limited. We may decide about a thing based on our knowledge. But the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect. He does not commit mistakes. So when we are ignorant about the knowledge of Allah, about the perfect nature of Allah, it leads to adam thiqa absence of trust with Allah. We can understand it with simple examples. For example, uh, when a person has sickness, he goes to the doctor uh, because he, uh, he believes in his ilm in his knowledge. He knows that this person is a specialist in this field and he will give me good advice. And this knowledge leads to thiqa in him, trust in him, he trusts the doctor. The doctor tells him you need a surgery and you may die in that surgery. Before we operate you, you have to sign documents that I, I will not take any responsibility. The patient says, okay, agrees on everything. And this is hardship, he may die. And even if he succeeds, he may have to face a lot of hardship, pain. But he agrees. Why? Thiqa, trust in that doctor. Okay? So jahal is a big problem. Jahal about Allah. Particularly ignorance about what is coming from Allah for us in our life. So whatever is happening in our life, whether good or bad, understanding it is one of the most profound forms of knowledge. Those who understand it, they reach the level of wilayah. And most, the majority of the creation, human beings, is ignorant about. Right? So shakwa, complaining in the heart, and this complaint, uh, it manifests itself verbally also and uh, in action it is based on absence of trust with Allah and absence of trust with Allah is based on jahal, ignorance about Allah. For this reason it is very important to understand the sunan of Allah, the divine patterns of Allah with human beings, with nations. So for a human being uh, personally, it's important to understand. But those who are involved in uh, creating a change in the ummah, activists working for revival in the ummah, one of the main uloom they must master, and this is Quranic, pure Quranic ilm, is understanding the sunan of Allah, understanding the divine patterns of Allah with nations. And this is very helpful in understanding history or the knowledge of history must be combined and we're talking about Muslim history and also human history it must be connected with the divine patterns of Allah about which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said 
You will not find any change, tabdeel, in divine patterns of Allah. You will not even find slightest change in the divine patterns of Allah. Tahweel. Very important. Okay. For this reason, uh, the scholars, they say, as-sabru, as-sabru, الصبر يكون بقدر الثقة Sometimes this pen gives hard time. It's not easy to write. الثقة بقدر الثقة As-sabru yakunu, sabr will be according to the trust, according to the level of the trust. So, sabr will be according to the trust. If the trust with, with Allah is strong, sabr will be strong. If the trust is weak, sabr will be weak. And they say, wabi qadril yasi. Takunul mashaqqa. Takunul mashaqqatu. And according to the yas, which is opposite of thiqah, hope, hopelessness will be mashaqqa, the hardship. So according to hopelessness will be, or despair, we can say despair is a better word. According to the level of despair will be the level of mashaqqa. And by mashaqqa, he means the spiritual mashaqqa. The hardship in the heart, the pain, the lack of uh, tranquility, lack of happiness, sadness, lack of satisfaction is because of despair or because of the absence of trust with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so let me uh, put a tashkil here. As-sabru, as sabru, yakunu, bi qadri thiqa, bi T. Wabi Qadri al Yasi Takunul Mashaqa. Sorry. Mashaqatu. Mashaqa is hardship, difficulty, but he is referring to the Mashaqa of the heart. Because everyone in our times is in Mashaqa inside. He's not happy. Happiness cannot, cannot be bought by money, by material blessings. Always remember this. This is a golden qaida in, in tasawwuf. Happiness is, the real happiness is the happiness of the nafs. If your nafs is in iztirab, the material blessings can never buy you happiness. You have to, in order to gain this happiness, attain sa'ada, you have to change your inner self. Okay? This is very important. And some ignorant people who don't know anything from ma'arif, from ma'arif, from, from uloom, from zahir about zahir, about batil, they say this has been uh, created to delude poor people. Now, when, when we say that the rich, they, they don't have itminan. They don't have uh, tranquility of the heart. And this has been, uh, this principle has been created to, uh, to, to, to make uh, a fool out of poor people or to delude them. But this is not true. This is not true. 
but it also does not mean that all rich people they 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 will be sad inside they they will not uh, have tranquility there are some rich people who are good who are pious okay so we are not talking about the zahir the discussion is about the batin okay so some scholars they summarize sabr into three types they say they use three terms for that number one is as-sabru or at-tasabburu tasabbur at-tasabburu tasabbur which is as-sabru because these are all types of sabr so sabr is a common meaning between them as-sabru lillah as-sabru sabr for allah what does it mean sabr for allah means tahammul al-mashaqi wa tajarru al-ghusas fi at-tabat it means enduring the difficulty and hardship of a thabat thabat means steadfastness okay because in order to remain pious in this dunya uh, and uh, to be on the straight path we have to practice thabat steadfastness you know we cannot pray for example sometimes and leave the prayer sometimes we cannot fast maybe once a lifetime and we don't fast uh, on other occasions we cannot we have to be steadfast we have to be always connected with allah always practicing our religion particularly the obligations we cannot stay away from sin sometimes and fall into the sins uh, on on other occasions we cannot do that so it requires thabat steadfastness okay and this thabat is called at tasabbur or sabr for allah for allah okay because these obligations and this religion it comes from allah subhanahu wa taala understanding that it contains benefit for me in dunya and akhirah and whatever uh, allah subhanahu wa taala has prohibited it contains harm for us in dunya and akhirah whether we understand it or we don't understand it so even in worldly matters we cannot reach our goals without mashaqqa in worldly matters people take more mashaqqa they endure more hardship when we compare with the religion we are talking about muslims in particular to attain the worldly goals to reach success we see how people endure how yani they uh, leave their their sleep their their some people they ignore their families for money they leave everything this is thabat but wrong thabat basically but the thabat is there the steadfastness is there so even worldly goals cannot be achieved without thabat what about the goals of akhirah so this is as-sabr lillah the mashaqqa will always be there sacrifice will always be there without enduring this hardship and mashaqqa and sacrifice we cannot become pious we cannot be good muslims and this is the meaning of a famous hadith in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said huffat al jannatu bil makarih jannah has been engulfed and covered with makarih with things which the nafs dislikes with hardship so the outer coming is uh, outer uh, uh, covering is hardship when you cross it you re- you reach pure blessing and huffat al naru bil shahawat and halfa has been covered with Uh, desires so the outer covering is desires when you cross it may allah protect us all when a person crosses it there is pure hardship without enduring this hardship and difficulty we can never enter jannah we can never become true muslims and this is a problem you know some people they want uh, to reach piety and practice islam without any hardship 
I don't want any hardship. Islam is easy. And they misunderstand the concept of ease in Islam. Ease is not according to our desires. Ease will be defined because the principle was given by Allah and his messenger. They will define it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the concept of ease and Adam will absence of haraj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want difficulty with you. Allah wants to create ease for you. The Prophet said, in the deen yusrun. Indeed, this religion is easy. Easy does not mean no hardship. Okay. For this reason, uh, the basic concept of legal responsibility is connoted by a term which we use in, in Islamic legal language. It's called a taklif. Taklif. Taklif means legal responsibility. Okay, we say, for example, what is the age of taklif? When does a human being or a Muslim reach the age of taklif? Age of puberty, age of legal responsibility. But the, the word taklif in itself, it comes from kulfa. Kulfa. Which means hardship. Because all these obligations staying away from sin, it requires sabbat. It involves hardship. Without taking that hardship, we cannot enter Jannah. So in Urdu also, taklif is kisi ko taklif dena, to harm someone. Right? Uh, because there is hardship involved in it. This is the first type, al tasabbur as sabru lillah, sabr for Allah. The second type is As-sabr, not tasabur. They call it, see the profound knowledge of the Sufi scholars, how they understand Quran and Sunnah. These concepts, they are not based on a new wahi. This is based on profound understanding, istimbat from Quran and Sunnah. Otherwise, the Quran is there, the Sunnah has been published, alhamdulillah, compiled. But the real knowledge is not only memorizing Quran and Sunnah, only quoting it. The real knowledge is reaching the deeper meanings, extracting the deeper meanings. Quran is an ocean without any shores. It is word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second type is as-sabr. They call it, now yani, we should not in ignorance object to the Sufis. Yani, how are you using sabr at the second level and tasabr in the first level? Sabr has been used in the Quran at the first level. Yeah, these are terms. These are, this is terminology. We must understand the meanings. As-sabru. As-sabru. Okay. They, or yani, this is the second level. This is number one. This is the second level. They call it As-sabru billah. As-sabru billah. Sabr with Allah. Billahi. The first was lillahi, for Allah. This is billahi. You know, when you are uh, steadfast on your religion, in the beginning, for a beginner, for a mubtadi, following Islam, uh, fulfilling the obligations, stay away, staying away from haram, and since it contains difficulty and hardship for the nafs, because the nafs has not been tamed yet. But when you cross that level, you reach a sabru billah, sabr with Allah. Now the obligations, fulfilling it becomes easy, easier, and staying away from haram and sin, it also becomes easier. And you reach a level where you cannot resist an obligation, a good deed. Your nafs becomes inclined towards it. You reach a level about which the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Bilal, arihna bis salah. Oh, oh Bilal, give us comfort by calling to the prayer. As if we are in difficulty and hardship uh, in dunya and uh, in worldly affairs, we want to come out of it and seek comfort and raha in prayer. Okay? 
Now it's the opposite. With the beginners, with us, we feel raha with dunya, with sitting with people, with speaking, with business, with going to the... Uh, this, this, is, this is the problem. Yani always understand the concepts in a deeper way. The worldview. Our worldview is different. Our comfort should be in our homes. Our comfort should be in the masjid. This concept of recreation, going out, outing for shopping. I'm bored in, ho in, my, ha in my home. I don't feel good. I want to go out for a picnic, which is halal, which is permissible. But the concept itself is alien to Islam or Islamic civilization. You will never see Sahaba going to uh, picnics and outing for raha. You know, why do we, this concept of recreation is based on uh, the problem which we are facing in the routine. The routine which we are following now, we are living uh, in a system based on the Western civilization it has created a lot of mental fatigue. People are not happy. I'm not going into the nature of the jobs and stuff, this and that, but this it has created. So coming to come out of this mental fatigue, we seek uh, the way out. Uh, we go out for outing, for shopping, for the concept of recreation. It was never there between the Sahaba and the Prophet Sallallahu You will never see. Give me one example. And I can give you many examples of the opposite. For example, uh, a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, give me permission, even leave siyaha, give me permission of tourism, if we translate it in a, this concept of tourism. Uh, and there are other evils connected with it. You know, tourism means alcohol. Tourism means zina. And this is intrinsic to it. It means facade, evil. I'm not saying everyone who goes out for raha commits zina or, or falls into sins. I'm not saying that, but everyone knows. So uh, he came to the Prophet and said, then leave siyaha. O Messenger of Allah, give me permission of siyaha. If we translate it literally, it means tourism. I want to. The Prophet said, the siyaha of a believer is jihad fi sabilillah. If you want to see, uh, yeah, you want to go out, you want to see different lands, you want to meet people, jihad, fighting in the path of Allah. Okay? A woman does not waste his time. We don't have this concept of recreation in that way. Yeah, we are facing mental fatigue in our homes, in our routine. A woman does not feel mental. Yeah, we don't have time. That's why you will see, you will read about the early scholars, for example, Sayyid ibn Musayyib, a great scholar from Tabi'een, Sayyid al Tabi'een. They say about him that he was, in his lifetime, people would find him only either in his home or in the masjid for 40 years. He was not seen anywhere else for 40 years. Sayyid ibn Musayyib, either in, in his home or in the masjid. <coughs> And you will see, you will read uh, this about many other Sahaba and scholars. Okay? So understand this. Asabru uh, billah. The scholars, they say, it is now o suhula to khaffifu anil anil thiqal. Okay? It is, we can, if we use one word, like we used thabat here, we will say suhula. It is ease. Ease. Because in, see, the, the scholars of Tasawwuf, they say the beginning levels in all uh, uh, abwab or all stations of spirituality, the beginning level is always tasanno. Remember this word, tasanno. Tasanno means uh, you have not achieved that inside, but you're trying to outside, you are, uh, you're, you're appearing to follow that station. So, uh, yani, for example, you don't want to cry inside, but you are uh, acting outside. So, tasanno, the beginning level is always tasanno. For example, uh, in uh, the Battle of Badr, about uh, the mas'ala of prisoners, when the Prophet took advice from the Sahaba, 
we know Umar radiallahu an, he gave a different advice, Abu Bakr gave a different advice, and eventually uh, the ayat which were revealed, uh, they agreed with the opinion of, the advice of Umar radiallahu an. And in one narration, Umar did not know this. He came to see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he saw the Prophet crying. Okay? I will not go into uh, the, the uh, ahkam of prisoners and stuff. But the point here is, Omar said, Ya Rasulullah, why are you crying? Tell me the reason. Please tell me the reason so that I can participate in crying. I will either cry or tabakaytu, or I will act. Uh, yani I, if I don't feel crying, but still to, to obey you, the Prophet ﷺ was crying, I should also do the same. I will act. As if I'm, I'm crying. So the first level is always tasanno. Yani, ikhlas, for example, sincerity. The beginning level is al always tasanno. You will have to force yourself to practice ikhlas. You will have to force yourself to practice sabr. You will have to force yourself to practice shukr. You will not achieve it inside. But outside, by your actions, you will have to force yourself. It would be tasanno. Sometimes you will feel the, uh, the, this particular station you, you don't have its reality inside. Why are you, you, know, you will feel as if you are showing off. But this is the first level until you reach uh, the second level. Here we are talking about sabr, but this applies on all other stations of spirituality. Okay, so this is suhula. Now in thabat, there is difficulty, hardship. Uh, it's uh, uh, hard on, on the nafs. You will not feel good uh, inside. Mashaqqa, but if you, uh, if you practice mujahada, if you fight, you will reach suhula. as sabru billah. as sabr uh, with Allah. as sabr with Allah in fulfilling the obligations, staying away from uh, sins, and uh, fulfilling the commands of Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, creating a change inside out. The third is the highest level. And it is the foundation of wilaya, attaining the friendship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For this reason, it's very difficult. Number three, they call it al-istibar. Al-istibar. And how do they explain it? They say, at-taladhudhu bil-balwa. At-taladhudhu. Bil Balwa At Talazuz Talazuzu Bil Balwa Balwa means test, particularly uh, the test which contains evil for us, hardship. Difficulty, sickness, disease, death, anything. At-taladzuz means feeling good, pleasure, taladzuz. Yeah, it's, it's uh, usually used for good taste. We say this ta'am, this food is ladiz, right? It has good taste. Taladzuz. So not only enduring the hardship, and this applies on basically uh, what we call as sabru ala Allah. So they say al istibar is as sabru patience on Allah. As sabru ala Allah. Okay. The first is at tasabru as sabru lillah. The second is as sabru as sabru billah. With Allah. This is as sabru ala Allah, on Allah. As sabru ala Allah means al fahmu anillah. So one is understanding Allah, understanding his names and attributes, understanding his oneness, understanding his uh, exaltedness, understanding his glory. It is one of the foundations of ma'rifah, knowledge awareness, but the peak is 
understanding from Allah. Whatever, whatever is happening in your life, whatever is happening around you, and at a higher level, whatever is happening with the ummah, connecting it with the sunan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here particularly, we're talking about tasawwuf. We are not talking about revival of the ummah. And it has a different uh, setting. We're talking about uh, personality change, understanding what is happening in our life, in my life, difficulties, hardships from Allah. Why is it happening? Yani this is the peak of knowledge. Everyone is not blessed with this knowledge. And when it happens, yani when this knowledge, because see, in the beginning we said al-jahal. The opposite of jahal is knowledge. Knowledge about Allah, knowledge with Allah, knowledge from Allah, it, its fruit, it necessitates thiqah, trust in Allah. Okay? So when you understand, yani you, you understand the meanings, higher meanings of what is happening in your life, and you introspect, you connect it with your actions, the endurance of hardship, tests will become easy. Not even easy, you will uh, take pleasure in enduring the hardship which comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And this is the highest form of ignoring or uh, abstaining from shakwa, not complaining. Okay, So to practice this, the early scholars, the Salaf, they would stay away from all forms of complaint. For example, some of them would even consider uh, say, uh, yani saying anything bad about the weather. You say, for example, today it's very cold, today it's very hot. They would consider it shakwa. We're not talking about haram, makroo. We're not talking about rulings. Forget about fiqh. This is not fiqh. This is kasu. This is tasawwuf. So it has its own principles. They would see subhanallah saying today is very hot. Today it's very cold. They would consider it from shakwa. According to their levels. Of course, we should not jump to the highest level without uh, without uh, attaining the basic levels. This would be ignorance if we do that. I don't know. Is, is there disturbance? From, I, I, I uh, request everyone to mute or uh, the admin should mute everyone. Fine. Khair. So, at-talazzudu bil-balwa. For this reason, you will see the great uh, prophets and the best example of this. All prophets are the best examples of all stations of spirituality. The Sahaba, Tabi'in. But in the Quran, the most uh, important example is the story of Ayyub and his test. And he was tested by uh, with the sickness and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has narrated his story so that we can take the best benefits from it in, in, in some surahs for, for example in Surah Al-Anbiya uh, Surah uh, Al-Sad okay, he was uh, tested with a, with, a, with a disease or sickness a skin disease as has come in the narrations. You know, for example, in Surah Al-Anbiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi minash shaytan al-rajim, wa ayyuba idh nada rabbahu anni massani yadurru wa anta arhamu al-rahimin. And remember Ayyub, alayhi salam. Mention Ayyub, when he called to his Lord, he said, indeed, adversity has touched me, and you are the most merciful of the merciful. فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ فَكَشَفْنَا مَا بِهِ مِنْ ضُرْ 
وآتيناه أهله ومثلهم معهم رحمة من عندنا وذكرى للعابدين So we responded to him and removed what afflicted him of adversity and we gave him back his family and the like thereof and uh, th with them as mercy from us and a reminder for the worshippers of Allah. This is Surah Al-Anbiya, Ayah 83 and 84. In Surah uh, Saud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions him again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذْكُرْ عَبْدَنَا أَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الشَّيْطَانُ بِنُصْبٍ وَعَذَابٍ أُرْقُضْ بِرِجْلِكَ هَذَا مُغْتَسَلٌ بَارِدٌ وَشَرَابٍ And remember our servant, Ayyub, when he called to his Lord, indeed shaitan has touched me with hardship and torment. See, adab, adab, adab of uh, the Anbiya. Everything, whatever ha happens, it happens by the will of Allah. He did not say, oh Allah, you have touched me with hardship. Whatever happens, it happens by the permission and will of Allah. But only good is attributed to Allah. And evil is not attributed to Allah. This is adab. Adab with Allah. So he was told, strike the ground with your foot. And this is a spring for a cool bath and drink. And it will give you shifa. And what was the, uh, what was the result? Fruit of this perseverance, of sabr, of this great iman, ilm from Allah. Thiqah, trust with Allah. Allah says, وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُمْ رَحْمَةً مِنَّا وَذِكْرَى لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ And we granted him his family and the like number with them as mercy from us and a reminder for those of understanding. So in both ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, because of this great endurance, great trust with Allah, Allah gave him two blessings. Number one, rahmah, mercy of Allah, and dhikra. A reminder, Allah made him the best example for all people to come. Then Allah says, وَخُذْ بِيَدِكَ ذِغْثًا فَضْرِبْ بِهِ وَلَا تَحْنَثْ إِنَّا وَجَدْنَاهُ صَابِرًا SubhanAllah. See, Allah says, we found him patient. We found him uh, a person who applied sabr in the best way. Allah is saying this. And not human being. Even if human beings say this is a, a pious person, a scholar, gives this testimony, it is a great testimony. But when Allah says this, it's something great. Inna wajadina hu sabira ni'mal abdu inna hu awab. Now, this is what I want to reflect. Uh, we, want, we should reflect on. I want to emphasize here awab, the quality of being awab. In this hardship difficulty, how did he? Uh, uh, he attained the station of sabr, the quality of being awab. So Allah says, we said, and take in your hand a bunch of grass and strike with it and do not break your oath. Indeed, we found him patient, okay, and an ex excellent servant. Indeed, he was one repeatedly turning back to Allah. Awab means someone who does not disconnect himself from Allah. Usually in hardship, we disconnect from Allah. Our nafs overwhelms us. We become so sad in despair that we disconnect ourselves from Allah. By despair, by lack of hope. And some others, yeah, this disconnection happens in hardship for some people and for some others in blessing. Blessing comes to them, many uh, best means of transportation, best job, bank balance, uh, all blessings. They are disconnected from Allah by this blessing and they fall into transgression. While some others, they, their transgression happens in difficulty and hardship. Okay, so if you look from this angle, you will not say, you will never say that uh, being rich is a blessing and being poor is a curse. Both poverty and blessing, both poverty and richness is a test. For some people, they are doomed in uh, richness and some are doomed in 
poverty. This is a test. Okay. So this quality of awab, Allah says, ni'mal abdu, how good as a slave he was. He was an excellent slave. Innahu awab, because he was connected with Allah. No hardship, no difficulty distracted him. This is the level when a person feels pleasure in balwa, pleasure in hardship. Okay, And this is the rida with Allah, which is the next uh, principle. Being pleased with Allah. And it, what happens is our problem is when good comes to us, we say alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah alladhi bi ni'matihi tatimmu salihat. Right? We have a new car, we write dua on it, or a new house, we say, Hadha min fadli rabbi. And this, this happens in our place, I don't know about uh, other places. This is from the fadl of my Lord. I write, yani. Sometimes this car is on loan, on riba, on interest, no problem. Hadha min fadli rabbi. This is from the fadl of my Lord. But when a difficulty comes, hardship, a little bit of difficulty, forget about uh, big tests. When difficulty happens, we forget. Right? We are not even able to show small patience. The best level is being pleased with Allah in ease and hardship. But this is the highest level. This is the iman of awliya. A person can reach that level, but it requires mujahada. It requires uh, perseverance. When in, in ease you say, Hada min fadli rabbi, your heart is, it's not only about uh, you know, verbally saying it, it's about the heart. Your heart is content, at peace, when something good happens. And you are at the same peace in hardship and difficulty in evil. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ taught us in morning and evening adhkar. Okay. Radi to Billahi Rabban. I'm pleased with Allah as my Lord. So this pleasure is not only in Ahkam that Allah gave me the best Sharia. This pleasure is basically in what is happening in my life. Okay. So the bottom line is. The bottom line, I will write it here, but I don't have space. Okay, let me write it here. They say, Ma sabara al abdu ala ni'matin faqadaha. إلا كان الصبر خيرا له منها خيرا له منها so they say ما صبر 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 الأبد على نعمة فقدها إلا كان كان الصبر صبر خيرا خيرا له منها. No slave of Allah if he is deprived of a نعمة and he remains patient on that, except this sabr becomes better for him than the ni'ma itself. Okay? So what does it mean? It means that the greatest ni'ma at a higher level for those who are very near to Allah is the ni'ma of deprivation. Deprivation. Al-faqd. Deprivation, this faqd here. Deprivation is the greatest ni'mah. And we are talking about worldly things, not uh, being deprived of akhirah. 
We're talking about material ni'am, material blessings. Deprivation is the best ni'mah. Okay? So, we will come to shukr, inshallah, in, in the coming sessions. Shukr, gratitude, thankfulness. The asas of shukr, the foundation of shukr is on ma'rifatun ni'am, understanding the blessings. And most of the creation, most of the people, they are deprived of this understanding. That's why they are not able to practice shukur in the best way. Ma'rifatun ni'am. Yani some people, or the majority, restricts blessings in material blessings only. Material blessings. Without understanding the fact that the material blessings are not blessings, technically. The worldly blessings, they are not pure blessings. Because the, the, the worldly blessings, they contain uh, the, the impurity of this world in it. For this reason, you will see that the worldly blessings will never satisfy a human being. In this dunya, the principle for a human being yani, with regards to satisfaction is a tahweel tahweel change change and this is the reason of sadness this is the reason of uh, sadness or not achieving self peace or inner peace tahweel if we are living in the cities we want to move to the villages or we want to go out for outing we go there after a week, we are bored, we want to come back. We have a certain blessing. I, yani this is my dream to achieve that blessing, to achieve this particular car. When I have that, when I fulfill my dream, after a while, I want to change. I'm, yani my heart is, my, my uh, nafs gets bored of that blessing. I want a different car. My dream is to have an iPhone. So when I achieve it, after a while, after a week, two weeks, three weeks, I'm bored of it. I want something new, change. This is the foundation of sadness because these blessings, they are not pure. How to understand that? Understand that when you are deprived of that blessing, you have a car, or when it gives you hardship, you are enjoying it, it's saving your time, mashallah. You love when you see this car outside your home every day. It fills you with your heart with tranquility. But sometimes when, you, when it breaks down on a highway and it gives you a difficult time, you get frustrated. You understand that this is not pure blessing. Okay? For this reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, and this would be the last point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, said about the ni'am, about the blessings of Jannah, or about the Jannah itself. La yabghuna anha hiwala. They will never wish, the people of Jannah will never wish transfer from Jannah. They will never wish change. Hiwala. Tahweel. Khalidina fiha la yabghuna anha hiwala. Okay, why? Because the blessings of Jannah are pure and here, like in dunya, the blessing changes, their change happens, tahweel. Change happens from best to worst. When blessings get old, car gets old, house gets old. A blessing does not become new every day. It becomes old. But the change in Jannah, in the blessings of Jannah, will be uh, the opposite of dunya. The blessing will become purer and purer every moment. For this reason, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the drinks of Jannah, you know, when you're thirsty and the first sip you take in hot weather, uh, you have the best drink which you like in front of you, the first uh, sip is the best. 
and the last sip is the worst because you're satisfied, right? But and this is and this applies to all blessings of uh, dunya. The first sip of that blessing is always filled with tranquility, and the last sip is the worst. You don't want to eat it. You're satisfied. Okay, but in Jannah it will it will it will be the opposite. The first sip will be the best, and the last sip will be even better. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about uh, the drinks of Jannah and the types Allah mentioned in the Quran, Allah said, misk. The last khitam, the end, would be musk, which means the last would be the best. And the blessings of Jannah will also change from best, from, from good to better to best. This, uh, this, uh, the change will happen uh, in uh, the blessings of Jannah, making it more pure. And in dunya, it is the opposite. This is the reason. For this reason, the scholars, they would consider deprivation the best ni'mah. Okay? Deprive, de being deprived of the worldly blessings and Allah gives you the spiritual blessings. Reflect on this ayah. This will be the last, insha'Allah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, educates his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I request everyone to please uh, mute and also close your videos. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala educates the prophet, sallallahu alayhi uh, wa sallam, uh, in this particular mas'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in surah to, to give you the ayah numbers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, in surah to al-hijr, ayah 88, 87 and 88. Let me read 88 first. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, educating the prophet. لا تمدن عينيك إلى ما متعنا به أزواجا منهم ولا تحزن عليهم واخفض جناحك للمؤمنين O Messenger of Allah, do not extend your eyes toward that by which we have given enjoyment to certain categories of the disbelievers from the worldly things. Do not extend your eyes to that and do not grieve over them and lower your wing to the believers. Focus on the believers. Educate them, train them. Don't extend your eyes to, to the material blessings we have given to the disbelievers. Okay? But before this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the blessing which Allah gave to the Prophet and then compared it with the material blessings. Allah said, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِي وَالْقُرْآنَ الْعَظِيمِ SubhanAllah, reflect on this ayah. And we have certainly given you, O Muhammad, seven of the often repeated verses, Surah Al-Fatiha and the great Quran. Okay, so seven verses, uh, seven ay ayat in comparison to the worldly blessings. Don't extend your eyes to the worldly blessings. We have given you seven ayat. This is the comparison. We have deprived you of the worldly blessings for our purpose, but we have given you the best spiritual blessings. Okay. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِي وَالْقُرْآنَ الْعَظِيمِ لَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَى مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِنْهُمْ وَلَا تَحْزَنْ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا تَحْزَنْ عَلَيْهِمْ وَاخْفِضْ جَنَاحَكَ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ صدق الله العظيم We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the best ni'am of dunya and akhira. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the fitan of dunya. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the fitan of akhira. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill our nufus with tranquility. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us achieving sabr, istibar, tasabbur, all realities and all levels of sabr. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the best of dunya and akhira. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make uh, our lives fruitful for us and for the people around us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill uh, the lives of our families uh, with baraka, our children with baraka and tranquility. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept us as sincere students of knowledge, 
to accept us as sincere uh, servants of his religion. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to lift the hardship and calamities from the ummah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, help us in giving our share and effort in revival of the ummah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uplift and grant glory and izzah and honor to the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his beautiful names and exalted attributes to, uh, to cure our sick and to forgive all our dead. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala nabi al-ummi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin. I know that we...